As we come to the scriptures here this morning, I set before you a passage that we find in the last chapter of John's Gospel, John 21, verses 1 to 14. John 21, 1 to 14. We stand for the reading of Scripture, do we? Please do so. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. I might just say that John the Golden Mouth, the 4th century bishop of Constantinople, was a prince among preachers. His passion was building up Christians in the word of God. He composed a prayer before listening to a sermon. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, Open the eyes of my heart, that I may hear your word and understand and do your will. For I am a sojourner upon the earth. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. Speak unto me your wisdom. On you I set my hope, O my God, that you will enlighten my mind and understanding with the light of your knowledge not only to cherish those things which are written, but to do them. Let your word and spirit serve my restoration, enlightenment, and sanctification for the salvation of my soul and the inheritance of life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. So in coming to this morning's text, we are bound to mark the unsettling and tumultuous events of our Lord's recent days, our text's recent days, that greatly affected the lives of so many close friends or disciples of Jesus and left them quite disruptive and disoriented. Certainly they were disruptive times that bore down on the life of Simon Peter 
whose life has been rocked by b betrayal and abandonment of Jesus and then the crucifixion of Jesus, incredulous reports by the women that Jesus was alive, and then Jesus' appearance to Peter on that first Easter Sunday as indeed alive. It was all very stupefying. In addition, there was the Mary's report from Mary Magdalene and the other Mary who went to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning. What report was that? The oral report that had stitched together a consensus of voices. Thus there was the voice of Easter morning's angels who had counseled the women, go quickly and tell his disciples that Jesus has risen from the dead and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Then Jesus had added his own voice for after the women departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy to run and tell Jesus' disciples what the angels had said, behold, Jesus met them and said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. In his volume, The Book of God, the Bible as a novel, Walter Wangerin's imagined narrative about Simon Peter tells how events might then have unfolded. Mary Magdalene said that we should go to Galilee. Mary Salome and Joanna agreed. They said that an angel told them that Jesus would meet us there. So we went. Everyone all the disciples, a very happy band, much chatter and singing. The weather was beautiful, clear, dry. The barley fields were white for harvest. I saw it all in gratitude and sorrow. Jesus' mother walked by John. She looked so lovely, I felt like crying. Thomas and Matthew were becoming good friends. My brother spent most of his time with Mary Magdalene. By the time we got to Capernaum, I couldn't stand it. Not anymore. I had to do something. Something I could throw my body into. Something familiar so I wouldn't have to think. I said, I'm going fishing. And ran away from the lot of them. I'd given my boat to my brother-in-law. He's a careful fisherman. Nets, lines, spears, mast, sail, oars. It was all in good condition. He wasn't there, but I didn't ask. I inspected the equipment and prepared the boat. And then, at dusk, just as I was shoving off, <laughs> here come a group of disciples, not a thought in their heads except to follow my lead. My brother came with me. Mary Magdalene, too, tucked herself down in the middle of the boat. James and John and Nathaniel began to get their boat ready while we pulled out. They knew where we would drop the nets. They would find us. Unquote. The suggestion of Wangerin's story rings true. In spite of great experiences recorded in chapter 20, the disciples haven't yet found their new direction and they've not yet discovered their identity in Christ. Accelerating changes of recent times have left their heads spinning and their hearts spinning as well. The disciples felt stuck, which only added to the pressure and to the burnout. All that chaos, all that stress. In response to the Lord's command, they now are returned to their familiar Galilee. And in many ways, not much seems to have changed. They are still a company united by the fact of their common calling and discipleship. According to verse 2, here are Peter and the sons of Zebedee, just like the old days. 
One of the stated two others of the disciples is likely to have been Andrew. And there you have the old foursome as described in Mark 1. Though the foursome is now joined by Thomas, called the twin, and Nathaniel, as well as the anonymous other of his disciples. Let's meditate for a moment on Peter's recourse. Peter's recourse. How now shall they then live? What shall they do? For having been rendered at loose ends, the general impression of the story is that the tumultuous events of the times have left the disciple fishermen without a purpose, scattered and seemingly on their own. And so, apparently, it seems that to Peter and to the others, there's nothing for it but to return to the old occupation, re-engagement with the occupation he knows best, but now looks like taking part in aimless activity out of desperation. Ever the action man, he is determined to make something happen. I'm going out to fish, he says, as if it was still at least an occasional pursuit. The word that Peter uses for I'm going out is characteristically translated as go his way, go his way. It expresses a completely voluntary and self-chosen action. His going is an individual act like I'm out of here. I'm gone. Bye. Or, I don't know about y'all, but I'm going off to fish. Such decisive confidence is hard for the other aimless and bewildered disciples to resist. Hence, they at once decide to join in. Hey, hey wait for us, buddy. We're coming with you. They're just as rudderless as Peter and therefore easily acquiesce to Peter's self-assured leadership as they head back to the familiar routines of life. They went their own way. Now, their initiative does, in some sense, raise the conundrum of what are we to do when life we know suddenly changes or it comes to an end. In our disorientation, should we simply do nothing? Philip Lloyd answers, no. When the pause comes because the bottom seems to have fallen out of our world, we are not to be idle or lay about despondently. We are to go on with the obvious tasks of the day. So there's a good case, he says, to be made for the wisdom of the disciples to return themselves to their fishing, unquote. But to my mind, still, that doesn't alter the fact that it is Peter's compulsion to action that prompts them all to return to their self-chosen occupation. For when people do, know, do not know what to do, they do what they know. They turn to the comfort of familiar activity. Peter is a fisherman, accustomed to the life of the sea. So he goes off to look for fish. The others are fishermen, so they do too. They take up their nets, row their boats, look for fish. Very natural. And there's the problem. Very natural. The disciples were returning to their former lives in more ways than one, relying merely on their own insight, leaning on their own prudence. Indeed, they proceeded to act and to do things just as they chose or desired. What happens? We pass from Peter's recourse to Peter's result. Peter's result. From what we know about ancient net fishing practices, 
it seems that it would have been entirely reasonable for the disciples to have expected a catch of fish from their shared nighttime endeavors. After all, night was the best time for fishing. Surely their prospects were good. And so they would have set out, indeed, with high hopes, optimistic about the chances for a successful venture, if not, maybe, for a second career. But we read, in that night, they caught nothing. The Greek is uden, not one thing. They caught nothing. We may observe several things here. First, in John's Gospel, night is a word of foreboding. For example, when we read concerning Judas that after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and John can't resist. It was night. Night portends something troubling. Night happens when things are dark, bleak, or at their worst. Night connotes a world without God's presence and blessing. Peter and the other disciples world without Jesus. Secondly, I say, let's give the pronoun its force. It was that night, says the text. It was that night. That night of all nights when conditions seemed optimal. That night when they took matters into their own hands to make something happen. That night when not knowing what to do or not having anything in particular to do, that night they caught nothing. Archbishop Temple remarks, the work which we do at the impulse of our own wills is futile. Surely it would have been better to sing, Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Or, Take my will and make it thine, It shall be no longer mine. And so their man-centered initiative and narrative proved fruitless. After the first flush of enthusiasm, the final result of Peter's and the disciples' nighttime endeavors was disillusionment and disappointment. Their undertaking was all for naught. And not surprisingly, we see that the disciples' reliance upon themselves and their own resources to negotiate life's challenges didn't turn out well, nor does it for anybody. Peter and the disciples would have done well to remember the words of Moses. If you aren't going with us, Lord, please don't let me make a move. Or Jesus himself, when he taught us to pray, lead us not into temptation. Thirdly here, we are reminded that enterprise zones without the Lord quickly become disillusionment zones. As Psalm 127, verse 1 put it, without the help of the Lord, constructive endeavors are useless. For example, if God doesn't build the house, the builders only build shacks. Or churches fail at being deep-spirited friends. Or investors get minimal returns. Or fishermen catch nothing, no matter how hard they work. In fact, the only promise or hope of a good outcome turns on God's blessings. 
for it is his blessing that makes life rich. Nothing we can do can improve on God. And so we come, thirdly, to Peter's rehabilitation. His recourse, his result, and now, finally, Peter's rehabilitation. It happens that Peter was once again at the end of his rope. He's been there several times, and he doesn't know which way to turn. Right there and then, in that nadir of his life, Jesus shows up to make the difference again. The story of so much from the Mount of Transfiguration to this incident is the story of Jesus showing up. It's amazing how often the text says Jesus came. For now, as the early glimmer of dawn appears, the fishermen see a figure standing on the beach. It is still too dark for recognition, but the stranger hails them as any casual passerby might do. Children, you don't have any fish, do you? Perhaps startled by what the stranger appears to know that no one else outside of them does, it no doubt was embarrassing to admit the failure of their efforts. How does he know that, they may have said to one another. But this is no time for saving face. It's no time to attempt a patch over. It's only time to come clean. And so they bark. No! The fishing trip had proved a bleak night indeed. Unexpectedly, in response to the disciples' abrupt and dejected reply, the stranger shares a word with them. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. The advice commends itself as so definite and so specific, says Archbishop Temple, that it must represent knowledge, whatever the source of it. Anyhow, the word buoys them up, for they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And surely there is encouragement for us here, namely, what is done in obedience to the Lord's word and to his command, even though he who issues the command may not be immediately recognized, or perhaps as a friendly stranger. Nevertheless, it results in overwhelming success. Bible stories throughout the Bible, a plethora of texts, shout the same outcome. I think, for example, of that original and foundational command of the Lord to fisherman Simon at the very outset of things recorded for us, at Luke 5, verses 4 to 10. And when he had finished speaking, teaching the crowd, Jesus said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But, on the strength of your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish. Their nets were breaking. Evidently, they don't hear, but they did when P the Lord first commissioned Peter. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And 
so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. The gift of God to those who follow his commands is always more than we can receive. That's what an ancient banqueter tells us in his 23rd Psalm written near the end of David's life. You treat me to a feast while my hostilities look on. You honor me as your guest. You revive my drooping head and you fill my cup with blessing until it overflows with 150 pleasures. That same psalmist in that same 23rd psalm says, truly your goodness and your gracious love chases after me, chases me down all the days of my life. So Jesus, who chased down and called his disciples to follow him, now shepherds his friends in their identity crisis. He does so this time to remind them of their kingdom calling in this paradigm shift of their lives. We might say that God is the God of second calling. Though I hazard to say it, it's better to say that God is the God of second and third and 70 times seven callings, if that's what it takes. Moreover, when Jesus does show up to call us back with his re rehabilitating word, he comes with all-knowing graciousness. Children, you don't have any fish do you? It tells us, my friends, doesn't it, that we have an understanding Lord, an understanding Savior, sympathetically in touch with our reality, all knowing of our bankruptcies, all knowing of our messes that we get into. Jesus salvages saints and sinners who sustain grievous losses or are deeply grieved on account of past delinquencies. <coughs> and as we see in the following verses, Jesus is on a post-resurrection mission of mercy to reinstate Peter, still deeply grieving over his denial of Jesus as a faithful disciple and follower. And as all of Scripture insists, Jesus, my friends, is always on the lookout to reinstate any believer who, in company with Asaph of Psalm 73, admits, I had nearly lost confidence. My faith was almost gone. I would hardly give a blooming nickel for the whole thing. Or, as he also puts it, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping. I was almost gone. My friends, by way of conclusion, whatever your futility, whatever your disappointment, Jesus wants to redeem your situation and your efforts for fruitful kingdom work. Moreover, whatever shape his rehab takes, he wants to remind you, apart from me, you can do nothing. The most important axiom of all Christian living. Of course, at one level, it's also a common grace, universal reality that bears on all humankind. For we must not forget that Jesus is the Father's beloved Son. And therefore, says the Apostle, 
the firstborn of all creation. By whom? And through whom? And for whom? All things were made, and all things were sustained. And so therefore, as we look around our world, we have to be aware that all who ignore our God nonetheless do all that they do still in him, for he is the glue that keeps the world together. And when he is not there, all disintegrates. But here now at another level, at a special level, at a redemptive, restorative level, in a world where Peter is disintegrating, we have another story, a deeper story, a church-related story, where the creator of the universe, the sustainer of everything, the energy supplier to uphold all of reality is also at once the one in whom, if the church abides, shall find constant cohesion and their life will be constantly coherent. So at a redemptive historical level, redemptive restorative level, Jesus' John 15 words are the important and the defining spiritual reality for every believer. Words which invoke the Holy Spirit who shall be in you. His words are those to which I alluded moments ago. Live in me. Make your home in me just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. I am the vine. You're the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is, is dead wood, gathered up and thrown on the bonfire. But if you make yourselves at home with me, and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. This is how my father shows who he is. When you are fruitful, when you mature as my disciples. I'm reminded of Mylon Lefebvre's song with its seafaring metaphor. Without him, I could do nothing. Would be drifting like a ship without a sail. It was first recorded by uh, Elvis, I think, in 1963 in his distinctly uh, dreamy way. Without him, I could do nothing. Without him, I'd surely fail. Without him, I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Please, don't turn him away. Oh Jesus, my Jesus, Without him, how lost I would be. My friends, it speaks highly for the disciples that faced with the futility of their endeavors, they immediately said yes to the Lord. They obeyed his command. Reminded of their calling, no longer would they lean on their own understanding, but they would trust him henceforth they would acknowledge him from now on and let him direct them in all their ways. For when they did throw the net on the right side, right in more ways than one, they took in a large haul. Little wonder that John should say about the stranger, it's the Lord. I don't think yet he could see him to identify him by first personal features. It's just that he knows his Lord so well that anything like this has to be the Lord. 
For dominion over all nature, says Psalm 8, verse 8, including the fish of the sea and whatever passes along the paths of the sea, all of that which was lost by Adam at the fall could only ever be restored in his master, the second Adam, indeed. It is, it has to be, the Lord. And so, at Jesus' renewed call, they had once again found direction and purpose and blessing as they now abided in his word. For surely we know, as Paul writes to the Romans, that in all things, all things, God worked for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. My friends, may God work all things for your good as you seek first the kingdom and the power and calling of the resurrected Lord and thus abide in him by putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. As the, as the psalmist exhorts us, rest in the Lord and abide patiently in him. Let us pray. Lord of the one true vine, in you we live and move and have our being. We are your branches, albeit spindly and slight and fragile. Plant us deep in the soil of your grace. Nurture us with the strength of Christ, the vine of everlasting life. Enlighten us with the wisdom of your spirit who flows through us today and all days. Abide in us that we may abide in you and live in your love unto a life of fruitful service. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So that